This period of time in uh, Red's country angst reminds me of a time that I was reading about something that Lance McAllister brought uh, to my memory last night on his show. I want to tell you why I think this is worse. This has to be the lowest that Red's country has ever been about their Cincinnati Reds. We're going to talk about that and the history of uh, what it was that I was thinking about looking back at Tony Perez. That's all coming up on today's Locked On Reds podcast. Thanks for joining me. Let's get started. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You have found the Locked On Reds podcast. Thanks again for coming back and joining me. If this is your first time, though, make sure that you're subscribed right here on YouTube or on your favorite podcasting app. We're covering the Reds every single day here this offseason as it looks to be an offseason of transition. An offseason that, gosh, it's it's not even really that old. And we're already hearing uh, very concerning things about our Cincinnati Reds and what the immediate future, i.e. 2022, might look like. We'll talk about that more ad nauseum tomorrow. Today, I, I was reminded of something from Lance McAllister last night on his show, following the Reds hot stove league on 700 WLW where he was talking about how he doesn't remember a time where Reds fans were this frustrated and this concerned about the immediate future of their team that it, really the only time that it compares to is back in 1977, whenever the Reds traded away Tony Perez. And real quick, this is a history lesson for most folks who probably know this intimately. Uh, There are some fans who are listening and watching, hopefully, that are uh, newer Reds fans, don't necessarily have that Big Red Machine firsthand experience like myself. Uh, So when I talk to you guys, this is kind of where I'm looking at here, but a brief history of what's going on. For those of you like my dad who knows this intimately, sorry for repeating anything, and you know, let me know if I get anything wrong or let me know what you thought during this time period. Because when I read about this, it's interesting. They had gotten to a point where Dan Dreesen looked like he was about to take over the first base position. And Tony Perez had been the guy. He had been the leader in the clubhouse for the big red machine. And he had been the kind of glue that held everything together. And then they decided to trade him. They decided to move on because they were losing Don Gullett to free agency. Even back then, and and it was a different free agent system, there's like a free agent draft, and I'd have to read up more as to how exactly that all went about because it's different from today. But the Reds didn't participate in free agency back then either. It was different, but they still didn't do it. As far as the Reds are concerned, that's nothing different. So in order to work around that in their estimation in their estimation and Bob Housem's in, you know his thought process for this whole thing they decided to trade Tony Perez and Will McEnany for a couple of pitchers one of which would retire during the middle of the next season simply because Sparky Anderson tried to move him to the bullpen and he didn't like that so he's like yeah I'm done So out of it, they literally got one relief pitcher. That trade couldn't have worked out worse. Plus, in 78, they really took a step back. They were in second place, which at the time wasn't a great thing. They didn't have the wild card and all that stuff, so it's not like they could get into the playoffs finishing second in the division. And when they did that, they fired Sparky. They let go of Pete. It was just a free fall of a couple of years. The big red machine was over, and everybody was understandably frustrated but at that point in time the reds were the top they were the best baseball team so to come down a little bit from that still meant that they were pretty good now in the in the early 80s and stuff they they set some pretty bad franchise records for rec, for win loss records during the season and they had to kind of revamp it. And it was interesting because even at that point, ownership decided that they would readjust. And instead of doing whatever it was they were in the early eighties, they brought back Bob Housem and Bob Housem brought back Tony Perez and Pete Rose and they readjusted and tried to win again. That sort of reminds me as to what Dick Williams did. Dick Williams tried to 
build a franchise through free agency and through trades that was going to compete and not necessarily the old adage and, and what we're hearing from Nick Crawl of we got to build from within. We got to draft, we got to develop, we got to call them up, and we got to keep them in the system. That's not where uh, they were for a couple of years there whenever they brought back Bob Hausman. But, but the whole point here is that looking back at this time period, the big red machine came to an end. And I don't think that that compares to where we are right now. Because at least back then, they were able to reassess and come back to things. It sounds like where we are right now, where Reds fans are right now, they are looking at a franchise that unless this franchise changes ownership hands, this is what we're going to be. We are going to be a team that as long as it is financially sustainable, they'll win. As long as the money adds up, yeah then we'll worry about the wins and losses. But finances seem to be the most important thing. And that is a bit concerning, especially considering I was building a checklist. And it's funny because now this seems superfluous, but as the playoffs began and the Reds were out of it, I said, all right, let's build a checklist. Let's talk about what the Reds need to do to get back into contention and make it back to the playoffs next year. We're going to have to blow that all up. We're going to have to start all over. Because the Reds have changed the entire big picture for themselves. And really, they were the only ones that did it. It's not as if anything necessitated it. It's not as if anything was happening to the point where they had to do it. Joey Votto is still going to be here. He's not retiring. Uh, They're not losing. I mean, they're losing Nick Castellanos. But they still had a pretty solid team if they were going to pick up options and, and maybe extend some guys. But here we are. And on tomorrow's podcast, we're going to break down who exactly the Reds will probably end up trading, at least so far as the most valuable trade chips that the Reds have. Yeah, if you've heard this before, that's because we were literally doing this like three years ago. And here we are again. Yeah, that is why I think that right now, and, and the other the other aspect of this, like talking about the Tony Perez and, and how the Big Red Machine came kind of falling down a little bit, was that Red fans still had the back-to-back World Series championships to hang their hat on because that was recent. That was, what have you done for me lately talk. That wasn't even that far off. We're talking about a franchise that has had zero playoff success since 1995, hasn't won a World Series since I was barely a year old in 1990. We're talking about a long time since they've been relevant. And that is concerning. And I wish ownership, I wish they had a different take on this. All right. We're going to talk about a couple of other things. I want to look at Nick Ladello. That's coming up here in just a minute. And just kind of, oh, vamp for a minute. (laughs) Sorry not to be frustrated on a Thursday, but man, it's just, it's annoying to see what's going on. Before we talk about that, though, I want to tell you about betonline.ag. Betonline.ag has a revamped interface to start the basketball season, and they've never had more props, odds, and lines than they have right now. BetOnline remains your number one spot for basketball and football action. Just head there today and set up your profile with the promo code locked on. You'll get 50% added onto your initial deposit on their brand new desktop or mobile website that's with the promo code locked on. From basketball, football, we got baseball offseason lines talking about some futures bets there, NHL, UFC, and boxing right down to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports. Go there today, set up your profile with the promo code locked on to get 50% added onto your initial deposit because betonline.ag is where the game starts. Oh, speaking of where the game starts, the nice thing is the Reds have a good leadoff hitter, and he won another award today. Sports Digest named him the NL Rookie of the Year. Seriously, he has he just he's got the best resume when you look at him compared to Dylan Carlson and Trevor Rogers, which are now the finalists. We have that narrowed down. 
Dylan Carlson and Trevor Rogers from Miami and from, uh, and uh, of course, Carlson from ugh, St. Louis. He's better than both those guys. And he is going to be the Reds leadoff hitter and second baseman for the foreseeable future. He is the kind of guy that you build this franchise around. If we're talking about that, our word, and I'm not going to use it maybe till tomorrow, but Jonathan India is going to be announced. He should be announced. He absolutely, I, I said going, I hope I didn't jinx it, but he absolutely should be announced as the NL rookie of the year. According to the baseball writers association of America, that comes on Monday. We'll be all over that here on the locked on reds podcast. And, and we'll kind of break down how he compares to other rookie of the year candidates for the reds over the years that he, if he wins would be the eighth BBWAA NL Rookie of the Year to wear a Cincinnati Reds uniform. We'll compare him to all those guys on Monday, hopefully with uh, the express intent that he gets the award, because he should. I also saw something that was cool that Nick Castellanos was offered by Jeff Ruby free dinner for an entire year if he signs with the Reds. Now, I think that really more pertained to the qualifying offer, but could you imagine free steak for an entire year? Hmm. Give me some of that steak burrow with a crawfish on there. Or, uh, man, what was that other one? That Collinsworth, steak Collinsworth. Yes. Give me that for free for a year. That'd be amazing. Now, I wonder if that would include drinks. That'd be kind of cool. Anyway, yeah, Castellanos given a perk by uh, Jeff Ruby if he were to come back. Again, uh, unless he takes. So last year, if you remember right, to compare, the Reds offered Trevor Bauer the qualifying offer, which he turned down. Reports were, and this were these reports came out well after he had already signed with the Dodgers, that the Reds had come back and offered him a little bit more than the qualifying offer. And by a little bit more, I think the qualifying offer last year was 18.2, and I believe the Reds offered 18.7. So I'm thinking that we're probably going to see something around like 18.9, million that the Reds offer Castellanos. He's going to make more than that. So unless the Jeff Ruby's is worth like $5 million, which depends on how much you eat at Jeff Ruby's every night for dinner, which in that point, and, and this reminds me of a story that I heard, and this is random, a little bit off topic, but there was a guy who literally spent $135 on food this past year because he went to six flags. I believe this is in Florida. I think that's where it was, but he, he spent, the money for a season pass and a meal pass. And he literally went there for all three meals of the day. And since he already bought the meal pass, he technically ate for free after that point. Can you imagine if you had at least one meal a day done all the time? That that would be amazing. But that's what he's looking at. I don't know that that's worth five, $6 million, which is probably more than what he would make on top of the 19 million that the Reds would in theory offer. I don't think they will. They they are making all kinds of statements that make me believe that they aren't even really going to tender a, a counter offer. Should Nick Castellanos get a big deal from somebody? That's a bit annoying, but yeah, th those were the couple of news and notes. And there were a couple of front office signings. You had the director of scouting was replaced and you also had Casey Weathers was added as a pitching coordinator he actually pitched for Derek Johnson, or he, he pitched at Vanderbilt. I, I think Derek Johnson was gone by this time, but he pitched at Vanderbilt, and he is a driveline guy. So, randomly enough, they get rid of Kyle Bodie, but they bring back in a driveline guy. So, I guess they like the driveline aspect so long as it fits within their mantra, so long as it fits within the whole plan that Derek Johnson has for everybody. Not necessarily they want that to be the word on pitching for the Cincinnati Reds. And it's just, it's more restructuring. And again, this goes back to the take that the Reds are positioning themselves to not compete. I don't know what to think about that, but We'll talk more about that on tomorrow's podcast. Uh, coming up here in just a minute, I want to talk about Nick Lodello because I want to talk about something fun. I want to talk about the future, the, the bright part of the future because lots of it isn't. This part is. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Oh. 
All right. So, uh, yeah, let's do this. Uh, we'll talk about Nicola Dello right now. Sorry. I'm just, I'm searching because my mind, I'm, I, I'm preoccupied. All right. In my estimation at the beginning of 2020, even though it was a shortened season, this was the start of the window. This was the beginning of contention in 2021. They were really going to take a step forward. They took a step back. All right, that's fine. Maybe we re recalibrate a few things in the off season, get ready for competition and playoff races in 2022. That's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the red saying things that lead me to believe they are going to be trying out young guys, trying out cheap guys, making sure that the roster itself doesn't cost that much money. And then we'll see what happens from there. That's no knock on the players. And I don't want anybody to think that I, I am advocating for the players to not play. Well, the players are going to play their hardest. That's what they do. They're professional baseball players, but the front office is not putting together the best roster that it can because the front office is putting together the most cost-effective roster than it can. So we're probably going to have to talk about some guys who fit into those kinds of plans. That's not near as fun as talking about, hey, can the Reds go get Carlos Correa? It's not happening. Let's talk about Nick Lodello. All right, Nick Lodello, this past season, dealt with some things. He started off pretty well. He started off in double-A Chattanooga, and I, I want to give a shout-out to a friend of the podcast, Doug Gray. He had a great write-up. He, he ranked Nick Lodello as the number three prospect in the Reds organization. He is going through and ranking the prospects right now if you subscribe to his Patreon page. Check out patreon.com and look up Doug Gray. Look up Reds Minor Leagues. You can contribute a couple of bucks to his cause, and, and he gives you a lot of really good insight about what's going on in the Reds farm system. And what he did here recently was talk about Nick Lodello. He kind of broke down his season. Nick Lodello started off well. He was striking out people. He wasn't walking people. And then all of a sudden, he gave up a few walks. And then the next start, he had a bounce back in a few innings. And then he developed a blister issue. And he had to be pulled. And he had to be skipped. And they thought they figured it out, pitched him again. Blister issue rose up again. So he's constantly dealing with that. When he finally got rid of it, he started pitching really well. And he started uh, getting the kind of attention that he deserved, and he got promoted to AAA. His first few starts were a bit of a struggle, did give up some runs, kind of bloated his ERA a little bit. So if you're going to go look at his prospect page and think you know anything about Nick Lodello by reading his ERA, good luck. But when, you, when he kind of figured it out a little bit more, he had to get shut down again. And they said and this was in August, the middle of August, they actually shut him down for the rest of the season because of shoulder soreness. Now, they said that it wasn't anything substantial, wasn't anything that required surgery or anything like that. They just wanted to be cautious with him. And that's good because hopefully he'll come into spring training 100% ready to go and ready to compete for a starting rotation spot, like Nick Crawl said. We'll see if that happens. Um but hopefully he is 100% healthy because the good news is this. He has a plus fastball. It's like 91 to 94 miles an hour and a plus slider. And that, and I also, I trust Doug's evaluation of that because I know Doug talks to a lot of different scouts. Plus Doug's a pretty smart dude. And when you look at the way that he pitches, he's got this like low three quarter delivery and I'm throwing with my right hand. He throws with his left hand. I don't throw with my left hand, whatever. Here's the left hand part. It's like right there. So when he's delivering that slider, and I was away from the microphone there, but when he delivers that slider, it has a sweeping action across the strike zone, and it kind of allows his fastball to be the setup pitch and then deceive people with the slider, and he's working on a changeup. The changeup's just okay in the scouting report estimation that Doug reported, and that's something that if he can get that, if he can improve that, over the off season and into spring training, that's probably going to go a long way in determining his roster spot for the 2022 season, because he's going to be a perfect uh, in the perfect wheelhouse for the reds. He's going to be making the minimum. They're not going to have to pay him very much. And he has the kind of talent that you can begin to lean on. And especially even right now, I believe that he could be the reds number five starter, but like Doug said in this report, if his changeup gets better, if he improves that changeup, he could be middle of the middle of the rotation, maybe right behind Tyler Malley and Luis Castillo and Sonny Gray. That would be awesome to see. 
if that happens. He is a guy that the Reds need to hang their hat on as we head into spring training. We already know that they are going to give Hunter Green plenty of opportunities because Hunter Green looks ready. And he's still got some, you know, I mean, every single prospect, no matter how good they are, still has a couple of question marks, a couple of things they need to work on because, well, they're prospects. They're not veterans. They're not guys that have pitched for a long time, but they've got upside. They've got the thing that the Reds need. They don't need to fill out the rotation with the Scott Feldman's of the world. They need to fill out the rotation with Hunter Green, Nick Lodello. They need to let Goody pitch a lot more next year. They need to have the young guys rolling if they're going to commit to this whole, "Eh, we're not going to worry about how much the roster costs to get to the playoffs. We want to make sure it's cheap. We want to make sure that we are getting the payroll and the budget and blah, 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 which really just fires everybody up. But there's a way to at least do this so that the Reds are still fun to watch. And I know that we're taking a big step back there because we were just happy about them being fun to watch in 2019. <sighs> but I think that's where we're looking at with this team. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to go into that a lot, uh, a lot more tomorrow. Today, I just I had that Tony Perez thing on my mind, and I wanted to talk about Nick Lodello because I saw that email from Doug Gray, and I thought that that was going to be awesome content for you. And, you know, Jeff Rubies. Who doesn't like Jeff Rubies? It's just, you know. How much is it worth to a guy who could be making $25 million elsewhere next year? That's the big question. Anyway, we will be talking a lot more about the fears that I have for the Reds in 2022 tomorrow on the podcast. Make sure that you're following me. Thank you. And I, I forgot to say this. Thank you for making me your hashtag first listen of the day. Now for your second listen, go check out Locked On Bets. I, I told you about betonline.ag, but your boy Q and Lee Sterling from Paramount Sports Talk about the best bets of the day, and they help you make some money over at betonline.ag. That's Locked On Bets, just like Locked On Reds, wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Uh, it, it's the offseason, and it's an offseason of transition, but we are Locked On Reds every single day.